Hello, in this video, we're going to talk about reflexes, the physiology of a reflex. A reflex is a subconscious stimulus response mechanism. Clinically, many reflexes are tested to identify any abnormalities in the reflex pathway, which may indicate problems within the central nervous system or the peripheral nervous system. Reflexes tested include superficial and deep tendon reflexes, such as triceps, biceps, brachioradialis, patella, and the Achilles reflex. What you are looking for in these reflexes are not the movement of the limbs, but rather the contraction of the actual muscles. A reflex involves sensory nerve fibers delivering information to the central nervous system and motor fibers carrying commands to the effectors via the peripheral nervous system. The reflex arc is the neural wiring of a single reflex and involves five steps. The spinal cord here corresponds with the central nervous system. The reflex arc includes a receptor reacting to a stimulus, such as this nail. The afferent neuron, the sensory neuron, transmits the impulse through the peripheral nerve to the central nervous system. The central nervous system is where information processing occurs. The afferent neuron, the sensory neuron, synapses with an efferent neuron or an interneuron, which will then relay information to the efferent neuron. The efferent neuron is the motor neuron, which exits the spinal cord and delivers the signal to an effector, which is the muscle or the gland. In this case, it is the muscle of the flexors of the hand, causing the hand to make a fist to withdraw from the stimulus. Reflexes are classified according to development, response, complexity, and processing side. Development include whether the reflex is innate or it's acquired. The reflex response is the nature of the resulting motor response, whether it's somatic or visceral. Complexity means the complexity of the neural circuit involved, whether it's a monosynaptic reflex or a polysynaptic reflex. And finally, the processing side, where the information is being processed, whether it's the spinal cord or the brain, both of which make up the central nervous system. In this video, we will talk about monosynaptic reflex and polysynaptic reflexes, and also mainly focus on the spinal cord as a site of information processing. Because really, most of the reflexes we test are spinal reflexes. Spinal reflexes range from simple monosynaptic reflexes to more complex polysynaptic. Let's first talk about monosynaptic reflexes, the stretch reflex. The monosynaptic reflex is the most rapid, simple reflex with a single synapse between the afferent neuron and the efferent neuron. An example of a monosynaptic reflex is a patellar reflex. The patellar reflex is a spinal reflex involving the knee joint. In this neural circuit, the patellar tendon is hit with a tendon hammer. The resulting effect is a contraction of the quadriceps and then the knee kicking out. There are sensory neurons innervating muscles and tendons which attach to the patella or the kneecap. When the patella tendon is hit, this will stimulate receptors within the muscle, which will then activate sensory nerve fibers. The receptors in the muscle fibers I'm talking about are called muscle spindles, which are extremely important in the reflex arc. Muscle spindles are receptors within muscle. Here is the tendon of the muscle. And here are the muscle fibers, which are called extrafusal muscle fibers, because these muscle fibers are responsible for muscle tone, muscle contraction, and then relaxation. The red surrounded by the extrafusal muscle fibers are the intrafusal muscle fibers, which are the muscle spindles. Muscle spindles are essentially receptors which respond to stretch and are innervated by sensory neurons, which are your afferent neurons in blue here. The afferent neurons, which have been activated or stimulated, will carry information to the spinal cord. The afferent neurons will synapse with the motor neuron, the efferent neuron. This is a monosynaptic reflex because it only involves one synapse. The efferent neuron will supply the quadricep muscle and will innervate the extrafusal muscle fibers. The efferent neuron will cause the extrafusal muscles of the quadriceps to contract, increasing muscle tone. 
This is a contraction of the quadriceps. When the quadriceps contract, the knee will kick out. Looking at the patellar reflex arc step by step, the stimulus is a tendon hammer hitting the patellar tendon, which will stimulate the intrafusal muscle fibers, the muscle spindles, the receptors within the muscle. The muscle spindles react to stretching and movement of the surrounding area. This in turn will stimulate the afferent neurons, the sensory neurons, which will carry the information to the spinal cord. The spinal cord is the information processing site, and so this is an example of a spinal reflex. The afferent neuron will synapse with an efferent neuron in the spinal cord. The efferent neuron, which is the motor neuron, is stimulated and will target the extrafusal muscles of the quadriceps. The extrafusal muscles of the quadriceps will contract, completing the patellar reflex or the knee jerk. Now, when we talk about muscle tone, we are essentially talking about the resistance of muscle to stretch. It's a good idea to get a grasp on muscle tone to understand some pathology that can be going on when testing knee reflexes. Here are two examples of a spinal reflex. The afferent sensory neuron in blue is bringing information to the spinal cord, synapses with an efferent neuron which will leave the spinal cord to supply a muscle, causing it to contract. If this area is severed, the efferent neuron there will be unable to deliver signals to the muscle because the muscle has no motor neuron supplying it. You expect the muscle to be hypotonic, low tone it will be flaccid because there is a disruption in the motor neuron supplying it. If, for example, the efferent neuron, the motor neuron, is continuously firing signals or there is no inhibition to that efferent neuron, the affected organ, being the muscle, will also get continuously stimulated and become hypertonic, spastic. The patellar reflex was an easy example of a monosynaptic reflex, a single synapse, the simplest reflex arc. A polysynaptic reflex produces a more complex response. There can be anywhere from two to hundreds of synapses within a polysynaptic reflex arc. All synaptic reflexes involves interneurons, intersegmental distribution along different uh, areas of the central nervous system and it also involves reciprocal inhibition. Here is the right leg and the knee joint. The anterior muscles of the thigh are the quadriceps and the posterior compartment are the hamstrings. The withdrawal reflex is a polysynaptic reflex that is initiated by nociceptive stimuli. It can serve as a protective mechanism to prevent further injury. The first part of the reflex pathway is a stimulation of receptors in the area, in this case due to a painful stimulus to the foot. The receptors will in turn activate the afferent neurons, which are your sensory neurons, which will bring this information to a specific spinal cord level, the processing center in the spinal cord. The afferent neuron will synapse with one or multiple interneurons. Interneurons here, drawn in black, are important in the reflex pathway as they enable the sensory neurons to communicate to many other neurons in the area. In this case, the interneuron will relay the afferent neuron's information to the efferent neuron. The efferent neuron, which is the motor neuron, will stimulate the hamstring muscles, which are your flexor muscles. The flexor muscles is the effector organ and then will contract. With polysynaptic reflex, as mentioned, there are many interneurons involved, and also the reflex involves different segments of the spinal cord. Here, the afferent neuron communicates with another segment of the spinal cord above and stimulates the interneuron there. Interestingly, the interneurons have another ability. They can be excitatory interneurons or they can be inhibitory interneurons. Excitatory interneurons mean they will stimulate the efferent neuron. Here, there is another efferent neuron supplying the hamstring, and so it is stimulated to propagate the, the response that we want. The inhibitory interneuron will inhibit the efferent neurons. In this case, it will inhibit efferent neurons which are supplying the extensor muscles, preventing the extensor muscles to contract. This is an example of a reciprocal inhibition we talked about earlier in the definition of polysynaptic reflexes. In summary, polysynaptic reflexes involve multiple interneurons, many spinal cord segments, and reciprocal inhibition. 
The brain can also affect spinal cord based reflexes. The brain can facilitate or inhibit reflex motor patterns based in the spinal cord. Here is a coronal section of the brain, cross section of the brainstem and the spinal cord. Let's take a look at the patellar reflex as an example of how the brain can affect the reflexes. Remember the patellar reflex involves striking the patellar tendon with a tendon hammer. This will stimulate sensory nerve fibers which will carry information to a specific level of the spinal cord where it will synapse with a motor neuron. The motor neuron will stimulate the quadriceps muscles. The quadriceps muscles, which are your extensor muscles, will contract and cause the knee to jerk up, basically. We learned this reflex to be a monosynaptic reflex, which it is. However, reflexes are also more complicated and usually involve more than one signal, single synapse. In the patellar reflex, it is understandable to say that the afferent neurons can also synapse with inhibitory interneurons, which will inhibit efferent neurons which supply the flexors of the leg, the hamstring muscles here, for example. This will allow for a more exaggerated kick. The brain can facilitate or inhibit reflex motor patterns based in the spinal cord. An example is a brain's power over the knee jerk reflex. Because consciously, we can inhibit the reflex. We can control whether our leg kicks out or not. This is because voluntary upper motor neurons can travel to that spinal level and stimulate or inhibit the lower motor neuron. We are able to tell our legs to not move, or we can even tell our legs to kick out on command. But this won't be a true reflex because we are actually voluntarily doing it. The plantar reflex or Babinski reflex is another reflex elicited during examination. It is a superficial reflex. The plantar reflex is performed by scraping the sole of the foot from its lateral aspect up and medial below the toes. This will stimulate sensory nerve fibers in the area. The afferent nerve will carry information to the spinal cord and synapse with an efferent neuron. The efferent neuron will target muscles involved in plantar flexion. And so a normal response is plantar flexion, the, curl, the toes curl down. Interestingly, in a normal plantar reflex, you have upper motor neurons continuously inhibiting efferent neurons responsible for stimulating the plantar extensor muscles, so thus they will inhibit dorsiflexion. A Babinski positive or Babinski sign is typically an abnormal sign. The reason is that when the sole of the foot is scraped, the afferent neuron is stimulated and will carry information to the spinal cord as per normal. It will synapse with an efferent neuron which will target the plantar reflex. However, in Babinski positive, there is upper motor neuron lesion somewhere. And this is known as a pyramidal lesion, as a pyramidal system is part of the voluntary control. As a result, the upper motor neurons do not inhibit the extensor plantar muscles. And so the extensor muscles can contract during this reflex and the toes curl up and fan out. The cause of Babinski's sign is either pyramidal lesions as mentioned or an underdeveloped pyramidal system. For example, when you are an infant, your pyramidal system is still developing. Thus, when you elicit the plantar reflex in an infant, it will show a positive Babinski sign. This is a primitive reflex in infants. The positive Babinski sign will eventually go away once the pyramidal system develops. It is very important to know that there is no such thing as a negative Babinski.